So hello, everybody, and welcome. Uh, we're going to be talking in this panel about caregivers uh, within the realm of ovarian cancer. And this is part of the third annual virtual global partner meeting. Um, my name is Golda Arthur. I'm really pleased to be doing this, this panel. Um, a little bit of an introduction and a background to me. My mom is an ovarian cancer survivor. Her name is Teresa Arthur, and she has so far made it through four rounds uh, of cancer in the last five years or so. Uh, I made a podcast recently about her experience and our experience as a family, um, and really a podcast about this cancer itself. Um, I am a caregiver for her, my father even more so, I would say. Um, and this podcast, I think, I'll speak only for myself, really helped me to process everything that had happened and everything that is happening and was a way for me to really get my head around what this cancer is and trying to understand it and the way we've dealt with it as a society as well. Um, so both the science and the society side of it. The show is called Overlooked. I'd love for you to check it out. Um, and I think that it really brought home to me uh, the role of a caregiver and the position that caregivers are in and what more we can do to help ourselves as caregivers, help others as caregivers. And so to talk about that in much more detail today, uh, I am joined by um, a really great panel of people and you'll hear from all of them very shortly. Um, I think it's painful whether you are in any position that you're in, whether you have lost a loved one, whether you are a current caregiver, whether you are a survivor uh, of ovarian cancer, these are painful positions to take. And I think that these three folks joining me today, thank you so much for uh, for the courage to to speak about these these issues and uh, hopefully help other people process this as well. So the three panelists uh, that I have with me today are Pamela Esposito Amory, who runs a brilliant organization called Tell Every Amazing Lady, based in Brooklyn here in New York. We have Saba Sadiq, who is an ovarian cancer survivor, and she is joining us from the UK. And we have Kevin Nesco, who is joining us from New Jersey. And Kevin, I would love to start with you. Would you tell us very briefly a little bit about yourself and your story? Well, I'm, I'm not as important as the story. My name is Kevin Nesco. As you said, I'm the proud and dedicated friend, partner, and husband of Bridget Nesco, uh, who was a registered nurse and have been for more than 27 years. Bridget's ovarian cancer was officially diagnosed in April 2021 at stage 3C. And as a registered nurse and nurse educator, Bridget understood what that meant. Despite the odds, Bridget had the strength, will, and determination to fight it as best she could, and that she did. Uh, but after 17 months, 21 chemotherapy treatment regimen, uh, Bridget suffered and died horribly at home in my arms, succumbing to the illness at 2.30 in the morning at November uh, 28, 2022 just a hair under a year ago. Her early signs and symptoms uh, of ovarian cancer were present as much as six years prior to her diagnosis, but they went overlooked and unaddressed by her mostly male medical team due to a lack of awareness and illness of the, uh, about the illness. Um, in response, I founded two organizations, one dedicated to providing scholarships to dependents of families impacted by ovarian cancer, and a second focused on uh, aggressive public and physician focused awareness and advocacy and a pilot program targeted to provide free CA-125 testing to women exhibiting three or more chronic symptoms of ovarian cancer. Um, I'm not of a medical background. Um, I'm a business guy. Um, I've served in a lot of different capacities. Uh, losing your spouse, uh, your love, your, your uh, life of 27 years is uh, uh, soul crushing. And um, I had to do something and this is how I responded. Thank you so much, Kevin. Um, and what a response. Um, that's great. Um, if I could turn to you next, Saba. Hi, Golda. Thank you, Kevin. I'm so sorry for your loss. Um, I'm Saba. I'm 54. And uh, last year, 18 months ago, my world was turned upside down with a diagnosis of uh, stage 3C low-grade ovarian cancer. I had no idea about cancer of the ovarian, didn't even know it existed. And within 10 days, I had to become an expert because the treatments were coming thick and fast. Um, the education 
uh, even you know on round female health is just just not there and um, ovarian cancer is a very little talked about subject here in the UK um, I had my initial surgery which failed because when they opened up the surgeon found that the cancer had spread too far to other vital organs and it would have compromised the quality of my life um, so they closed back up leaving me with 48 stitches chest to pelvic and absolutely zero to show for it apart from PTSD, because you build yourself up for these surgeries. They are huge um, and it takes a lot of physical and mental strength. I then went on to do IV chemo, which again failed because um, low grade responds very badly to IV chemo. I was then put on to oral chemo, which if I thought IV chemo was bad, it was horrendous. The side effects I am still suffering from now. Um, thankfully, though, it did enough to shrink the tumours. And in February of this year, I had my second surgery. Um, amazingly, I am 100% tumour free with no residual disease. The physical scars are there, but there are a lot of mental scars that are still there, too. Um, not only for myself, but also for those loved ones around me that had to watch me go through 18 months from hell. Thank you, Saba. And I mean, that sounds like a truly harrowing story, but I'm so glad that you're sitting here and talking to us about mm -hmm. it so eloquently as well. Um, Pamela, what about you? Thank you, everyone, for sharing. Um, so my story begins with my sister, who was diagnosed with ovarian cancer in 2007. And in response to her getting this diagnosis and living in New York City, the capital of the world, and not being able to find ovarian cancer resources, we started our own. Um, so our foundation that we started together um, before she did lose her battle with about a four year battle of the disease, we started uh, with four pillars to remission that were the things she was looking for. Spreading awareness to a disease that she couldn't understand why we didn't know the signs and symptoms, being educated, going to doctors often, doing all the right things and still had no idea what the symptoms were, neither did her doctors. Um, survivor support, which provides resources for the entire family. Cancer hits the whole family, not just the one individual. Medical research, which is greatly needed because this disease does not have a screening test. And wellness. Wellness is something that we actually added more recently because of the obvious reasons of how important that can also help all of us. But it also offers um, some uh, uh, support that Louisa used to use as resources herself, and it also expands for the whole family as well. Um, I believe I'm a part of this panel today because I'm also a caregiver, or were a caregiver. Um, before she passed, I was all the way down to you know her healthcare proxy. I helped her organize hospice, her funeral. I mean, all the way to the end. Um, I was her rock in those uh, areas, but I also was her cheerleader. And I know that that has lent itself in so many ways to the work that I've been doing for 15 years. Thank you so much for, for sharing that, Pamela. And I want to stay with you, actually, and, and ask uh, the next question. But I, I wanted to bring some context to this. The first time Pamela and I met was back in 2018, 2019, when my mom was first diagnosed. And I interviewed Pamela. And um, we had uh, at, at that time, of course, I was like, I'm going to make a podcast, I'm going to make a podcast. And the interview that I did with her, when I listen back to it now and think back on it now, it was it was when I was so fresh and so new to all of these issues. And I everything that Pamela said, I, I took it in in a certain way. Five years later, when this show was finally made, so back in August of this year, I went back um, because I thought, I think it's important to go, to go back. And I came to it with a completely different mindset, of course, and I, it, it helped me to, um, to understand uh, uh, Pamela and Louisa's journey in a very different way, I think, just having had all that water under my own bridge, so to speak. So um, it's something that you said both times, uh, Pamela, and I do want to talk about the support services that Teal provides. But before we get there, something that you that you said really resonated with me, which was about being uh, a rock and a cheerleader. And when you talk about it now, it's like, these are two different things, right? The, the qualities that you need to be either of these things for someone in order to support them are vastly different. Tell me a little bit more about how you switched from one to the other and what that, you know, how, what, what, how that manifested. 
Um, I mean, it just, it, it varied every day. You know, I am human, just like everyone who's in this caregiver role. It's tough work. It's the hardest job we're going to have going through this process with our loved one. Um, and oftentimes it's just like me. It was the first time I was going through it. It's not like we're, you know, you get trained to be a caregiver. It's very, it's a very difficult role. So um, to answer your question and maybe give some examples, I could say up until the very end, my sister Louisa was very hopeful. So we remained hopeful and I made sure that I put that smile on my face and was hopeful. And I believed it. I did believe it because it was, what else could you believe in, right? Um, so that's where the cheerleader came in. And it's also where, you know, we talked about when she was in the hospital uh, with some of her first surgeries, first diagnosis. When we get out, we're going to go do an ovarian cancer walk. There must be one that we'll find. And we couldn't find one. So I literally found a permit and made, uh, we started one. We actually made the walk that we couldn't find. And that's actually how our foundation started. So um, we're both very driven people and uh, very positive to begin with. So I know that that helped. Everybody does not find those uh, those emotions very easy to uh, gain at this hard time. But then also, you know, being the rock when the going gets tough and things were not looking so good, I still did my best to remain optimistic, but I also knew that I need to, needed to gather information with her. Like we would actually go to conferences, we'd educate ourselves, but also, um, you know, when it was time to literally plan her funeral, there was no one else that she could talk to about that and really dig into those hard things that she just needed somebody to make sure that her wishes were, you know, she had children and her wishes were really important to figure out and line up and understand. And um, it just was, I was honored to have those jobs and have those roles. And for me, I did somehow find it easy. It just felt like something I was supposed to be doing and it led me to where I am today. Yeah. And, um, you know, Teal does does so much today as well. It's just such a such a brilliant organization. I'm also interested in this idea of taking action as a caregiver. Um, and so let me turn to you next, Kevin, and get you to say a little bit more about the impact on you as a caregiver for your wife, Bridget. Sure. Absolutely. Um, as, uh, as I said, Bridget and I were married, we've been together for 20, we had been together, have been together for 27 years. And, um, as a man, um, and not to be sexist about it, it's in our DNA to save and to protect our loved ones and, uh, to, uh, to be completely hollowed out by not being able to do that, <clears throat> um, is, uh, as I said, soul crushing. Um, Bridget and I lived alone. Uh, we have a son who is uh, who is in Wyoming. Uh, but as far as the uh, caregiver, you're looking at him. Um, I was the sole caregiver. She did have, she does have uh, family. Uh, they did uh, come in and out of the picture um, towards the end. They were more active. But the bottom line is um, uh, when we switched over, we have a terrific uh, hospice program here called Samaritan Hospice. They did step in and help um, maybe an hour, a half hour a day, every couple of days uh, towards the end of my baby's life. Um, but uh, in the final analysis, when she needed to go to the bathroom, uh, I was the guy who carried her. And when we couldn't make it, I was the guy who took care of that too. Um, her sister did help towards the end. She was with us at the uh, towards the, uh, the last week or two. But the bottom line is, is um, you're all alone. And I'm not medically educated. Um, I was angry about the fact that the physicians missed the signs and the symptoms for so many years. She had undergone a hysterectomy uh, six years prior and did not have her ovaries, but um, a terrific uh, hospital facility in New York City um, did in fact identify from slides that she, she had ovarian cancer up to six years prior to the time it was actually diagnosed. Um, and so I was a, uh, I'm a guy who was left trying to take care of and save his wife at a time when it couldn't. And there really, other than a hospice program and occasional family inter interventions, there really isn't much, uh, much support for caregivers in, uh, in the New Jersey, or at least maybe in the, in the United States area. You know, there's so much there that you just said, Kevin, that I want to pick up on, and we could do like another three Zooms probably just, just to talk about all of that stuff. I mean, one of uh, just listening to all of you, actually, one of the things that I'm thinking of now is we are all from such different 
places in life, walks in life, backgrounds, uh, and yet the commonalities of this disease, how it appears, how it's dealt with, how its treatment or lack thereof, its diagnosis or lack thereof, is just like weirdly common over time, over generation, over location. Uh, one of my mom's gynecologists, uh, um, oncologists told me once, this cancer has been outsmarting us for a long time. And I know that, you know, I want to keep people focused on the fact that the needle is moving finally, you know, in small and important and significant ways. But um, Bridget's story as well of, uh, you know, of, of a cancer sort of appearing there um, way before is is just it's a it's a stunning it's a stunning story but uh but let me keep us focused on on caregiving let me turn to you um saba and your perspective is is a little bit different because you uh you had your husband and your grown-up kids around you um and when we talked for the first time you said something that stays with me still and i would love for you to tell us more about it which is you were watching them watch you and that's such a powerful thing to say as well. Can you think of a moment when that that happened and sort of how that unfolded and tell us about it? Yeah, I mean, cancer, you know, you the, the physical challenges that you face through your treatment um, are awful, but there are also mental challenges that, that come as a consequence of that. IV chemo left me broken physically and mentally. And for me, uh, there was a three week window. I had reached the stage where enough was enough. My body was just so broken. I wanted I wanted treatment to stop. I wanted it to end. I wanted everything to end. The pain that I used to see in my husband's eyes as he was it very much like you, Kevin, you know, you go to the you need to go to the bathroom. He's the one taking me making breakfast. He's the one bringing it. There were points when I didn't make it to the bathroom and he was taking care of it. Sure. So it was the pain that I would see in his eyes and his helplessness at the situation we were both in. And we came at it with no education whatsoever on what to expect. And that made it 10 times harder. The symptoms that chemo threw up, we had no clue about. And we were learning as we were going along. And, you know, we used to have this little routine where um, I was already staying downstairs because the chemo had given me peripheral neuropathy. I couldn't manage the steps. I'd all, I was also uh, just two months out of my first surgery, so I was still healing and recovering. So I was sleeping on a bed, that a little bedroom he'd set up for me downstairs. He'd come down, help me to the bathroom. We'd have a wash. He'd get breakfast. We'd come and sit together. And all I would see is I would see the pain in his eyes because he was watching me and I was watching him just be helpless because the symptoms were just so overwhelming. It was nothing either of us could do to control that situation. We just had, we reached a stage where we just had to go with it. So each morning we got up and what came that day came and we dealt with it. Um, the impact on my children was very different my daughters were amazing. A mother and a daughter have that that bond, that link, and they stepped up, as Pamela says, my biggest cheerleaders, but my biggest carers as well. Um, I was physically left that I couldn't even go to the shower by myself because there was a risk I would fall. So they were doing absolutely everything for me. My son, on the other hand, emotionally just had no idea on how to process all of this. And, and for him, he had other ways of showing his love and his care. Um, I love chocolate. And his way of showing his love was he would come home from work, come and sit next to me, hold my hand, give me a kiss and give me a small bar of chocolate. And that was his love language. So each of them had displayed different ways of coping, uh, different ways of expressing their emotions and different ways of dealing with it. But the hardest part for me was that I was watching them see me so helpless because as a mother, you tend to be the center of the home. I was, my husband and I also run our own business. So that was 50% of the workforce he's just now lost and having to deal with that too. So the added pressures were just, they were mounting, but it was that helplessness of being, if just watching them watch me and not being able to do anything about it. And there were points when I would, they would ask, are you okay? Do you need anything? And I would say, yeah, I'm fine. I'm good. 
because I could I didn't want to burden them any further. I could see the pain they were in. Yeah, I mean, helplessness is a really um, powerful feeling, a powerful emotion, a powerful position to be in, in both ways, because I think our reaction as caregivers, our reaction as people to helplessness is uh, is interesting to watch what people do, right? Sometimes you go the other way, you say, this, this, here's this one thing I can do, I'm going to do it. Uh, sometimes it uh, it keeps you stuck in the position because you, you just can't move move out of it. And so it's I think helplessness is something I'd love to come back to actually when we talk about support services um, uh, or how, ways to support support services is grander than than what it could actually be actually because I think support can take different forms. But uh, let's talk about let's talk about support services now that we're we're at this point. And I'd love to see if we can um, play out the video. Um, and we have a video now from Dr. Lauren Williams at Ovarian Cancer Australia, and she's going to be talking about um, some of the services that they provide. So let's listen and watch. Hi, everybody. Thanks for having me. And um, sorry, I can't be there due to the time zone difference. Um, my name's Lauren Williams. I'm a clinical psychologist at Ovarian Cancer Australia and also the manager of the psychosocial support team. Um, for those of you who don't know, Ovarian Cancer Australia is an independent national not-for-profit organisation that was founded in 2001 um, as a result of the woman with ovarian cancer, Sheila Lee who was actually the first ovarian cancer advocate in Australia who saw the need for more awareness, more advocacy, more research and support. And so our mission at OCA is to save lives and also to ensure that no woman walks alone. However, and as is the topic of today's conversations, and I'm sure everybody is very well aware, um, within that there's often a forgotten part of the dynamic when it comes to ovarian cancer or any cancer for that matter. Um, alongside the significant psychological, psychosocial and physical effects of ovarian cancer and treatment um, that a woman may experience, there's another person, a caregiver, often a partner or spouse, who is profoundly affected. The role of a caregiver is usually really sudden with enormous impacts on finances, work, social, physical and psychological domains. There's a huge increase in roles and responsibility and there's some research to indicate that this can actually be up to 30 hours a week, which, you know, when you think about it, can really comprise a part time or for many a full time role. Uh, and carers often put a lot of pressure on themselves to be the perfect carer. And that can be really difficult, I think. Um, what I see clinically are really significant impacts for many carers and partners on their sleep. Definitely work and social life, um, often having to call in sick to work at the last minute or changing jobs, cancelling social plans at the last minute, um, even not being able to regularly engage in their exercise or community groups. Um, that can be really difficult. I also see high levels of anxiety, irritability, low mood and for some depression. Um, distress over sexual relationships and intimacy is also observed and really quite common. Um, and, you know, when caregiver duties go on for many months or years, as is often the case with ovarian cancer, um, that can lead to caregiver burnout, relationship stress and sometimes arguments and conflict. And sometimes people say that, that the arguments and conflict occur in a relationship where this has not previously been a feature and that can be a really difficult uh, adjustment and something really difficult to experience. We know from our research that clinical levels of fear of cancer occurrence, for example, occur in up to 89% of caregivers and that one in five carers report moderate or severe levels of anxiety and depression. Um, we also know that there's a lot of grief experienced, grief for a life lost, um, grief for a future lost, anticipatory grief over uh, the future loss of a loved one and for many grief after a loved one dies. We also know that carers definitely benefit the person with ovarian cancer, but they also really benefit the healthcare system. And I think this is something that's often under-recognised. Carers are really a crucial unpaid workforce when it comes to ovarian cancer treatment and management. 
despite all of this and despite all the needs and distress that we know exists for carers uh, and partners of someone with ovarian cancer, we know the offering of support, both professional and social, is often much, much less than what we see is offered to the person with ovarian cancer. Um, in addition to less support being offered, we also know that partners and caregivers are much less likely to engage with support. And there's lots of different reasons, I think, why this happens. I think sometimes it's just pure fatigue and exhaustion being a carer and maybe experiencing caregiver burnout that makes it hard to reach out for support. I think people often prefer that the support is directed to the person with ovarian cancer or they feel a lot of guilt um, with their partner or spouse or person that they're caring for knowing that they're actually struggling and having difficulty, for example, with sleep and anxiety and low mood. And that can make it really hard to reach out as well. Um, sometimes people just aren't willing to acknowledge their own distress in order to protect the person with ovarian cancer. So that can also get in the way of reaching out. Um, at OCA, we find that male partners in particular have engaged in our support services at much lower rates than the woman with ovarian cancer and female partners. So at OCA, uh, we've responded to some of the needs and this is still a work in progress and we hope to continue and focus on research and understanding the needs of carers and partners more to be able to offer more support services. But at the moment, what we offer is a written resource directed to male partners that's actually a free download on our website. And so it's a brilliant resource that was written specifically following some research and focus groups with male partners. We also offer a male partner uh, peer support group once a month that's facilitated by one of our mental health social workers. And that really gives men an opportunity to meet other men in a similar situation to them. We also offer free and unlimited one-on-one -on -one counselling, either with psychologists like myself or with one of our counsellors or mental health social workers. We offer grief and bereavement support following the loss of a loved one. And we continue to work on providing more options and resources for carers and partners of people with ovarian cancer. So hopefully that's been helpful and adds some content, content and information to the conversations had today. And hopefully the rest of the session goes well. And thank you again for allowing me to present today. I want to turn to you next, Pamela, and um, just talk a little bit about the kind of support services that you guys provide and how you regard caregivers at Teal. Sure. Well, one thing I would love to just uh, emphasize that I heard with in Dr. Williams that I translate is um, taking care of self before you can take care of others. That is definitely one of the uh, advice tools that we give anybody who comes to us with a family member diagnosed and something that was really hard for me to remember to do. Um, but I do want to um, mention and, and uh, emphasize as well that, you know, it's the whole family. We, you know, even though I said I'm, I was her rock and her cheerleader, you know, she had a husband, she had children, my parents were involved. There were so many people around her supporting, but there were just certain things that were put on me. Um, and I think in the caregiver role that also, um, you know, this is how our, our programs were actually developed. And so I want to paint a little bit of that picture. So for us, it was really the experience of the entire family. And maybe one person was driving her to the chemo appointments. One person was at home uh, helping her with meals, but another person might have been dealing with the paperwork and, you know, the cheering or something like that. So it is more than one person at times, if lucky, if someone has more than one person. Um, and so what, I, what this trickles down to is, I'll give some examples. When we uh, provide some of our nationwide support. So even though we're based in Brooklyn, we are nationwide. One of the tools that we have is we ship out chemo kits and a woman who's ever diagnosed with ovarian cancer in her lifetime can enroll in this free program. They can get materials sent to their home, but also available, you know, remotely or online. And we always include um, a caregiver toolkit because that is going to someone's home. And that is something that is easily forgotten. The doctors may not be offering that help. They may not have a social worker they're dealing with. So simply by us putting the caregiver toolkit, um, which is just a pamphlet at this time um, into that kit, it's it's life changing at times. You know, they pass it on to their loved one and say, hang, hang on a minute, you're a part of this process too. Um, so that's one little area. And then we offer 
uh, workshops that whether they're in our center or on Zoom, they're open to everyone. So all of our programs are open to everyone, including the general public for education as well. Um, we sometimes look at the caregiver as, you know, part of the uh, the process of the therapy of whatever this person is going through. So they can, for example, do the meditation together, but other times, you know, maybe they want to also just have their own support group or they need their own resources or just want to talk to someone or, or care. We either have, you know, resources or referrals for them as well. We have programs called the daughters of Teal, the men of Teal. Some of those at times are also grief counseling um, or support services. So there's a lot of different things we offer, including like art therapy, education. We have our walks and runs. And then lastly, just to um, kind of bring it all together, we do believe that anybody impacted by this disease is just a part of our community. Com the word community is so important to us. So we do a lot of events. And at these events, we bring people together. And those people come together and say, oh, wow, you know, finally I met somebody else who understands and somebody else who's going through this and their family's been impacted. That goes both for the survivor and the patient to the families who've been impacted by this. And that is so important to us. So everything that we do, um, we try to remember that it affects the whole family because in fact, that's how our foundation was started. And that is a great uh, emphasis that you guys put on the family. When I think about my own family, of course, uh, my father was the main caregiver for, for my mom with me sort of flying back home to Canada, uh, you know, as often as I could. My sister absolutely 100% in the role of cheerleader, much more so than, than I could be, I think, personality wise as well. My brother um, spent a great deal of time going home, um, leaving his family to go and uh, and take care of, uh, help take care of mom and dad. And so the family is impacted. I think a recognition is the first step there. So thank you for, for definitely putting that front and center. Um, Pamela, that's really great. Can you tell us a little bit about that aspect of like what, what was different about having to do this and the act of being supported or the act of asking for support um, sure. in your experience? Uh, every time I talked to my wife for 27 years, I would always end the conversation or throughout the conversation and say, I love you. And guys would just say, why do you say that? And it's like, well, why don't you? What is wrong with you? Um, I, I, Pamela and I have talked about this, about men of teal. And I just don't understand uh, how it is that men do not understand the connectivity between having a mother and a daughter and a wife or a spouse or a friend or a partner of some kind uh, um, and how important it is to at least get behind supporting the signs and the symptoms and understanding and forcing doctors to do testing. Um, and uh, I, I guess... Um, as a, a, a very cancer PTSD survivor, or at least I'm standing here today as a survivor, um, you know, it's it's hard. I'm still in the middle of grief, but I don't understand. And I talk, I've talked to an awful lot of men, uh, awful lot of men since my wife died who've lost uh, their wives or their daughters to ovarian cancer. And after they kind of fall back into a self-healing process and uh, ice out the world and don't understand that there is a need for them to get active, to turn that anger uh, and the sadness into something that's po positive and proactive to help other women. And as you know, by midnight tonight, another 570 women in worldwide will have died from brain cancer. And how many of those could have been saved? Um, that's being a man in, uh, in a brain cancer world. And um, I'm hoping to do what I can to uh, move the needle ahead to get them more involved. Yeah, thanks for that. And that, you know, interesting statistic to keep being, keep being reminded of, um, reminded of as well. Saba, I have a specific question for you. And it's a two parter. Um, so the first is, what support do you wish your caregivers had that they didn't? And what does it look like right now? Um, in England in general? For, in terms of support for caregivers? Okay, so I'll start with the second question first, if I may. Um, pretty sparse, to be honest. Um, and the other problem that added to all of that was that there is there's very little education and information with regards to ovarian cancer. So that's the beginning point. So our initial 
point was that we had to go and search and you know there were some really really dodgy websites that we found and you know it was trying to navigate where we could get authentic information um, support services wise, there is very little around ovarian cancer. Here in the UK, you've got a few um, of the cancers that have had a lot of traction. So things like breast cancer, there's lots of information, there's lots of literature, there's lots of campaigns, um, and there are a, a lot of support services. With regards to ovarian cancer, there were there are very few. There, and I could probably just you know name you a handful of charities that provide you specific support for ovarian cancer. The other thing that that also impacted was the fact that from the minute I was diagnosed, I was on a bullet train because treatment was going at 100 miles an hour. I didn't have the time to look into support services. My caregivers, you know, my husband, my children, they didn't have that luxury because they were just trying to juggle and manage going from day to day. So the lack of information, the lack of services and them just not having the time to be able to. To, to go and look for help they were too tired they were exhausted physically and mentally because they were just you know it was hospital appointment my life became home hospital a and e or or the doctor's surgery and and that was it so there was no time to go and look for support services i've only connected with a number of the charities post my ned diagnosis where i've had the physical and mental capacity and have now investigated the support services that are available not only for patients but also their caregivers but the time's gone they don't need it now you know i'm in a better place they're in a better place life's coming back to an even keel so it's it's become a little bit irrelevant going to your first question what would i have liked I would have liked more information from um, my clinicians, from the oncologists, uh, about signposting, about directing you to where you could get help, um, not only for the patient, but also those loved ones that are supporting you. The other thing that I would is so, so important, that support needs to be culturally appropriate as well, because there are so many services out there um, and they are great and they are doing some fantastic work. But when I used to look at their information and I used to look at their booklets, we would look at it and think, well, that's not really for me because I wasn't represented. And, and if there was South Asian representation, it was very stereotypical. And again, I don't feel that I'm a, a typical South Asian. So, you know, it, it, the, that whole thing about visibility and representation, that's something I would really change. I'd encourage the oncologists and the surgical teams and the clinicians to be better at signposting and directing you. I wish, Pamela, we had something like Teal here in the UK. Uh, we've got Target Ovarian Cancer and they are doing some brilliant, brilliant work. Um, but just, again, more information. More information. And does that does that and that also includes I'm hearing you say you know a pulling together of existing information and directing people in that uh, to that role Saba just to follow up on there where should that come from should that come from clinicians where where would you wish you you know there there's no one-stop shop for you there right or there wasn't at the time no, um, I mean, for, for me, we're fortunate that we've got the NHS here in the UK. It's free at the point of use and that it's a jewel. It is an absolute jewel um, and they are stretched because of funding and underfunding. Um, I think ideally for me, through those 18 months of my treatment journey, my focal point of contact was my oncology team and I think they are probably going to be able to serve as the best people to be able to provide that extended support because you're you're also appointed what's called a CNS a cancer nurse specialist who's a specialist cancer nurse and you have emergency phone contacts for them you've got to navigate a navigator service where you're able to get in touch with them 24 hours a day they are essential not only in your treatment but in also being uh, really good at signposting and providing you information i think that it, it needs to come from the oncology team and the cnss that's what needs to be developed yeah and i mean okay oncology nurses are a, a whole thing unto themselves i've done half an episode on them just, just this week in fact they're a pretty pretty special uh type of um medical personnel absolutely we love we love them all just to bring us to a sense of wrap up i'd love to hear from each of you any kind of concluding thoughts of um of what you're taking away from our discussion today whether it be 
you know, that you heard something here that you're really comforted or cheered on by, or that you heard something here that you want to go away and fix because it's a bigger problem than you than you thought it was. So um, can we stay with you, Saba, and, and uh, hear your wrap up thoughts on this? Yeah, of course. Um, it was really interesting to to hear Kevin's perspective because obviously as a man, um, watching my husband and what he went through, it's given me a greater understanding of the times when he was just silent because he didn't have the ability to express what was actually going on in his head because there was just absolutely so much to deal with. It's also given me a complete understanding of... Um, you know, the male perspective on being, you know, the strong, silent types, got to take care of everybody, has got to hold it together. Um, and I think it's it's really hard for, for him, not only being a man, but being a South Asian man, there are certain things culturally that also impact the way he responded and reacted. Um, and it's really given me a deeper understanding of, where his mind also went while he was watching me face the challenges that I was facing. You touched upon grief and, and um, you know, you talked about anticipatory grief, but there was another aspect that really resonated with me. And that was grief of him seeing me lose the life that I was living pre-cancer. I was this active um, a mum of three, running around, running a business, running um, a small charity, doing community work. And all of a sudden, I was just re reduced to this person that couldn't even get up and go to the bathroom by herself. And that, th that grief for him was quite hard to cope with because he was just watching the person that he fell in love with fall apart. And he couldn't compute that. Um, and the whole fatigue thing, that really is so important because he always felt that he had to, it, it didn't matter what time of the day it was, if I got up at three o'clock, he would jump up. It was like he wasn't even sleeping. He was just anticipating, oh, is she going to need anything? Am I going to have to do anything for her? And I really wish in hindsight I could go back and I, I could say to him, look, it's okay. You're allowed some me time. You're allowed some self-care. It's okay for you to not be okay. Um so yeah, that, that lots of things to take away from today. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. And Kevin, what about you? Um, uh, thank you, Saba, and um, and um, uh, I'm glad I can help with giving you an idea of what how, what, how men are. Um, we don't sleep. I haven't slept since September of last year. Um, I get maybe two, three hours a night. Um, Self care not going to happen. Men just don't do that. What we're interested in doing is taking care of the ones we loved. Um, and you could preach it from the from the the top of the chapel. We're not still not going to hear it until the job is done, one way or the other. And then Pamela, let's end with you. I mean, just to say, by the way, there's so much here. I think we could go on for another 45 minutes easily. Um, yeah. But Pamela, I'd love to hear your your thoughts to wrap this up. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I echo a lot of uh, what was just said, and um, it's just so important to be talking about this and recognizing. Um, that there is a role to the caregiver. And I think recognizing it to begin with is something great where, you know, hopefully people will find this video and it know that it's okay to reach out. Um, just know that it's okay and you're not alone. Um, just starting with that and being able to know that there are resources out there. Um, I encourage people, like Kevin said, you know, there's so many wonderful organizations out there and there are resources. Many people just don't know because they didn't think they needed them and don't even know where to look for them. So that's a challenge in itself that May 8th, again, with World Day, bringing things together. We need more things that, you know, initiatives that can bring us all together. That's so important. Um, and if anybody is looking for help, of course, you know, tellamazinglady.org is a resource. Um, we can provide resources all over the United States. And, you know, I just welcome anyone to uh, even use us as a guide and look at things on our website. We would love to help everybody that we can. Well, this has been such an enriching 
um, discussion from me as well. And I just want to say thank you to all three of you. I'm so, um, I always think that, you know, in, inside every bit of trouble is, is a gift somehow. And it's a little controversial because there are some really dark things out there and how can there be a gift, a gift in them. But I think my mom would agree with me because she's the original, uh, optimist in my life and, uh, meeting the three of you and doing this for the, for, uh, the world ovarian cancer for Folks has been a gift certainly for me so even though it uh, took us some pain to get here I'm glad to have met all three of you to hear your journeys and to hear what you've done with with your journeys which has been um, even better so once again thank you so much I hope if you're watching this you have found uh, inspiration and comfort I hope you know that you're not alone that you must take care of yourself as well as you take care of uh, your loved one or took care of your loved one. Um, and best of luck to to everybody going forward.